Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Indian Navy and Western Naval Command, I, Ira Gosavi, welcome you on this fine evening to this enthralling webinar on the 1971 war, the Indian Navy's finest hour. Buckle your seatbelts, for we are about to embark on a journey of grit, ingenuity, valor, and determination displayed by the Indian Navy during the 1971 war, which resulted not only in a resounding victory for the nation, but also gave birth to Bangladesh. I would first like to invite Commodore Srikant Kesmoor, officer in charge of the Naval History Project and director of the Maritime Warfare Center, Mumbai, to briefly take us through this journey. Thank you, Ira. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, boys and girls. On behalf of the Western Naval Command, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this live webcast of the show 1971 Indian Navy's Finest Hour. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a reason why we call it so. The Indian Navy began as a very small force of less than half a dozen sloops at the dawn of independence. Immediately thereafter, we supported the army in Junagadh operations. 14 years later, in the war for liberation of Goa, Daman and Diu, the Indian Navy played a significant role. In 1965, we were assigned a defensive role and we fulfilled all the requirements of that role. However, it was in 1971 that the Indian Navy finally came of age. And that is because she was able to express herself across the entire canvas of maritime operations. The 1971 war saw the Indian Navy perform in two distinct theaters, the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. Not only did we sink ships and hit shore infrastructure, but the entire gamut of naval operations, be it surface operations, be it air operations, be it carrier operations, be it submarine operations and deployment of submarines, being anti-submarine operations and destruction of a Pakistani submarine, be it amphibious operations, riverine operations, special operations, deceptions, name it, and the whole canvas as was etched by the Indian Navy. Above all, ladies and gentlemen, let us remember that the reason we had more than 90,000 prisoners of war was because the Indian Navy strangulated both the east and west parts of Pakistan and thus prevented any entry or access. Now, owing to all of this, many people called 1971 the Indian Navy's finest hour. Ladies and gentlemen, it is extremely difficult to encapsulate two weeks of war in two hours. But today, we're making an attempt to do so in two parts. In first part, young members of the naval community will attempt to recount the war for all of you, bringing some of the highlights. In the second part, and buckle your seats for that, I'm going to be talking to some war veterans, to some people who were a part of that war and have them reminisce about the many operations that they were a part of. That's not all. We will give some of you a chance to interact with them by typing your questions in the chat box and we will take these questions. We will be happy to have them answer it for all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say a brief word about our lovely, vivacious host for the evening, Ira. Ira is a final year law student who is excellent at debating. She plays lots of games, particularly she is good at squash. She is the proud daughter of a naval aviator who himself is a gallantry award winner twice over. So Ira, on the day that India and New Zealand aim for cricketing glory, tell me who is going to open the batting from our side? Thank you, Commodore Kisnur. 
I have the privilege of inviting Ms. Meera Bhadri, a doctoral scholar and lecturer who enjoys spending her evenings engrossed in the workings of political thought and theory, peace and conflict studies, and international relations. When she isn't haranguing her students or conducting research, as a proud wife of a submariner, she is busy contributing to Navy's welfare activities and lending her voice to diverse events, including short films. Thank you so much, Ira. Namaskar and greetings to all. It gives me great pride to be part of Indian Navy's Swarnim Vijay Varsh, celebrations of the 1971 Indo-Pak War. Indeed, Indian Navy's finest hour. The 1971 war was a watershed in the life of the young 24-year-old Indian Navy. I'm here to present a prelude to this momentous war sort of a curtain raiser to the exciting adventure we are going to embark on. Let us dive deep into history and examine the context of the war, geopolitical and strategic. Let me first bring to fore the erstwhile East Pakistan, a landmass surrounded by India on its three sides and also separated by India from West Pakistan, a literal state sharing coastline with Bay of Bengal and home to the world's largest delta. This part of Pakistan was situated closer to India's eastern border and its northeastern states. With a majority Bengali-speaking population that stood at 65 million at the time, compared to 58 million in West, East was never at socio-cultural, educational, economic, or even political parity with West. The question is, what created the rift between East and West? Well, honestly, it wasn't created. East had always been underrepresented and underdeveloped. And to add to the woes, government of Pakistan did little to ameliorate the terrible state of East in the aftermath of Bola cyclone of November 70 that killed over three lakh people. A man of vitality and charisma, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman became the leader of Banglas in the East, symbolizing their hopes and voicing their grievances. He was the leader of Awami League, a party with liberal and secular values. He spearheaded an election campaign for the December 70 elections that focused on discrimination of East by West Pakistan and aimed at a confederate with nearly autonom autonomous regions. Now, in the verdict of these elections, quite evident from this picture here, Awami League won a landslide victory in the East. And with 167 seats, it was also in majority in the National Assembly of Pakistan. President Yahya Khan's expectations of a coalition government were dashed, and so was his choice in Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the Pakistan People's Party leader, who towed the military line to oppose self-determination of Bangla nationalists. The month of March would be eventful. Yahya, along with his close aide Bhutto, decided to hold talks with Mujibur, a total ruse for something more sinister in the making. On the pretext of talks, what Bangladesh witnessed was suppression of democracy, using both political domination and military force. Mujibur was charged with sedition, arrested and imprisoned. This drew the last straw for people in the East. Before arrest, Mujibur declared independence by East Pakistan. On 25th March, marauding Pakistani forces waged an unprovoked crackdown in the form of Operation Searchlight. Operation Searchlight led to a civil war in the East. The operation continued with armed vigilante groups like Razakars, Al Badars, Al Shams joining in and soon turned into a genocide. The immediate consequence of the gruesome operation was formation of Mukti Bahini, a guerrilla resistance force to fight the Pakistani aggression and repression in what later became the Mukti Juddho or Liberation War. The spillover of this civil war hit India in the form of an exodus of refugees into the Indian territory. 
a crisis of epic proportions confronting the Indian government and administration. To put things into perspective, hundreds were dead on the first night of the genocide, and the toll stood at 3 million within a few months from the onslaught of Operation Searchlight. There were grave crimes committed on women, children, and all this was part of a targeted elimination of individuals on grounds of religion, race, language, and even political belief. It has been recorded President Yaya saying at a meeting in February 71, kill 3 million of them and the rest will eat out of our hands. The green arrows on the map depict the refugee movements into India. India at the Executive Committee of UN Human Rights Commission explained the scale and the magnitude of this crisis faced by India, putting the figure at 9 million people and was predicted to cross 12 million by November 1971. Without any foreign aid, Indian government built camps for refugees in Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram, and also made provisions for their food, water, clothes, and bedding. April saw the proclamation of independence of Bangladesh from Pakistan by the provincial government headed by Mujibur's nominee, Tajuddin Ahmad. Indira Gandhi, the then Indian Prime Minister, met him and on his request decided to house them in an old research and analysis wing building in Calcutta, which then became the Bangladeshi government in exile. Rising numbers of fleeing refugees, increasing crimes in Bangladesh, and no signs of political solution led to a huge pressure on India to intervene militarily. Indira Gandhi convened a meeting of all the chiefs to explore all options in the eventuality of India having to go to war. The Prime Minister was advised that summer was inappropriate as the Himalayan passes were open, while the monsoons would lead to flooding and obstruct troop movement. And further, there was a need for logistic buildup in the theatres for war. Therefore, it was clear that the forces were strategically disadvantaged at the time and needed the right time to retaliate. Seeing this need for war readiness, Indira Gandhi traveled extensively to apprise the world of the unprecedented humanitarian crisis facing India. She tried to build consensus on the issue of the genocide and its perpetrators and also to force a UN resolution. With the political leadership sensitized towards a possibility of a more offensive role for the Navy, Indian Navy was now raring to go to action. Admiral S.M. Nanda, the chief of the naval staff at the time, was resolute that the Indian Navy must adopt an aggressive posture. This resolve came from the awareness of the decisive, force-multiplying effect that such a maritime posturing would have on the war's outcome. Simulations were devised, war games in full swing, new tactics and strategies were being developed, intelligence collection was gathering pace. Each of these strategies would later translate to effective on-ground tactics. Indian Navy was using missile boats for the first time. And yes, it wasn't going to be easy. The handling of these missiles was a very sensitive activity. Loading and unloading of missiles and radar system calibration required a great amount of skill and training. Wars are won in the general's tent. In this case, it was the dockyards. Naval dockyards on the eastern and western front pulled out all stops to support the Navy in its war effort. This war for the first time had urged the nation to look beyond its continental focus. Let me now briefly discuss the role of great powers in the 71 war. A significant development was the reaction of the U.S. Council General in Dhaka, Mr. Archer Blood, who shot a descent cable to the White House, which later uh, became famous as the Blood Telegram, where he mentioned U.S. failure in denouncing West Pakistan for its role in the genocide, terming it moral bankruptcy. This picture highlights the geopolitical and strategic utility of Pakistan for the Americans. The tilt towards Pakistan was because of the role that Pakistan played in helping United States and China re-establish relations, which then was a priority for America. 
Hence, U.S. continued to lean towards Pakistan despite the telegram. Evident in President Nixon's written reply to this memo, and I quote, to all hands, don't squeeze Yaya at this time. Signed, Richard Nixon, unquote. Taking note of this, India proactively pursued diplomacy with Soviet Union and signed the Indo-Soviet Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation. This treaty proved to be a strategic offset to the us Park china triangle, with India receiving strategic support from Kremlin. Notwithstanding, towards the end of the war, US decided to deploy its USS Enterprise Carrier Battle Group in Bay of Bengal. While India invoked both political and strategic measures, Indian Navy continued unfazed. I want to bring out a particular incident in regards to the announcement of USS Enterprise sailing towards Bay of Bengal. The Prime Minister sent for Admiral Nanda and asked, what will you do if you come across them? Admiral Nanda replied, and I quote, ma'am, I have given instructions to my captains to treat them as friends and to invite them on board for a drink. Unquote. Admiral Krishnan, the flag officer commanding in chief, Eastern Naval Command, in his book states, and I quote, none of us ever fell for the gimmick that the fleet's object was to evacuate a handful of American subjects from the civil war in Dhaka. You don't require an elephant gun to shoot at a flea, unquote. After nine months of armed repression, unending genocide and complete apathy of global powers and even international organizations, India was now prepared to retaliate and end the crimes and atrocities committed by Pakistan on people of Bangladesh. Realizing the futility of expecting its allies to participate directly in the war, Pakistan decided to strike India preemptively. And what happened on the night of the 3rd of a cold cutthroat December is known to all. However, what followed became the legacy of Indian Navy. Indian Navy's daring operations brought resounding victory to India, turning Pakistani offensive into a military misadventure, wiping out half of its Navy, one fourth of its Air Force and one third of its Army. Indian Navy's stupendous success in 71 war definitely led to a paradigm shift in Indian strategic thinking, adding to it the critical maritime dimension. And it underscored the Indian Navy as a versatile and potent force. Dear audience, I will leave you all with this iconic image of the surrender ceremony of December 16, 1971. This war was symbolic of the highest level of joint effort achieved by our armed forces to convert challenges into opportunities. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important takeaway of the War of 71, particularly for young boys and girls watching. Be proud of India's military and maritime history and help preserve it. Thank you, Jai Hind and Sham No Varunaha. And now to continue our odyssey of India's remarkable naval triumph, let me call the effervescent Generation Z back into the studio. Ira, it's over to you. Having had that bird's eye view into the groundwork of the war, Next, we have Lieutenant Commander Anant Kukreti, who is a true explorer, but not just at sea, at, as you would expect him to be. He is a proud Everest summiteer. Yes, you heard right. He climbed atop the highest peak in the world in May of 2017. So I think for him, it's safe to say the sky is the limit. The officer will take us to the exciting operations of the Western Theatre of the Indian Navy. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Ira. A very good evening to all the viewers across the world who have tuned in for this program. With the geopolitical dynamics so clearly elucidated by Mira, let me take you straight into the heart of action that unfolded on the Western seaboard during the fateful fortnight of December 1971. The situation in the East was grim and conflict seemed imminent. The naval top brass too had envisaged the impending war at sea. On 2nd December 1971, 
After months of preparation, the Western fleet set sail from the Mumbai harbor. Before we look at the events that unfolded over the next week, it is imperative to understand the geography of the area of operations. West and East Pakistan were two distinct geographical entities separated by a 1600 mile, which roughly translates to 3000 kilometers wide landmass of Indian mainland. The only supply route was from sea from Karachi, the only major port of Pakistan from which West Pakistan could realistically expect to sustain operations in the East. A large chunk of foreign aid that Pakistan expected to receive from its allies would also have to be at this port. Apart from being a crucial economic hub, Karachi was also the nerve center of Pakistan's naval leadership. Safety of Karachi was therefore an overriding absolute for Pakistan. Pakistan's air force, surface ships and craft in the Arabian Sea were tasked with the obvious objective of guarding this port. The Indian fleet was stationed some 200 miles, which is roughly 300 kilometers south of Karachi. The objective for the fleet were clearly laid out to search and destroy Pakistan Navy ships, submarines and aircraft operating in the Arabian Sea to choke the supply routes from West Pakistan and in turn to affect a complete blockade of Karachi. A week before this, that is on 26th November 1971, Indian Navy moved two of its missile boats closer to West Pakistan. Missile boats Nirghat and Vidyut were stationed at a small port facility in Okha, Gujarat, some 325 kilometers from Karachi. These missile boats were destined to play a crucial role in days to come. It was the 3rd of December 1971. Pakistan executed Operation Chengiz Khan and Pakistan's air force struck deep into the Indian territory. This was an unprovoked act of aggression. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi later through a radio broadcast uprised the nation. A full scale war against us. The Pakistan Air Force suddenly struck at our airfields in Amritsar, Pathankot, Srinagar, Avantipur, Uttarlai, Jodhpur, Ambala and Agra. Message by the Prime Minister was followed by orders from the Chief of the Naval Staff. A signal from the Naval Headquarters to the entire service read, Pakistan has committed an unprovoked aggression against us and our defense forces have been ordered to meet this challenge with full courage and determination. My objective is to search and destroy Pakistani warships and along with sister services to inflict maximum damage on the enemy war machines. The signal further read, no sacrifice should be too much for us. Let us write a new chapter in the history of our services. Meanwhile, in the Arabian Sea, the Indian fleet detected Pakistan's maritime reconnaissance aircraft, keeping a close vigil on its movements. The fleet split itself in two groups and employed some swift maneuvers to throw the enemy off. This caused slight panic in the enemy camp and in the cover of confusion that ensued, Veer and Nipat, two missile boats, successfully evaded detection and proceeded to Saurashtra coasts to execute what came to be known as Operation Trident. Veer and Nipat were two of the eight newly acquired missile boats that were part of the killer squadron. These ships had three distinct characteristics. One, high speed. Two, their small size. And these two were crucial advantages to evade pickup from enemy sensors. The only handicap these boats had was their limited endurance. And to mitigate this, the missile boats were to be towed to a certain distance before the launch of Operation Trident. On 4th December 1971, the Indian Navy executed the operation. Nirghat and Vidyut came to highest state of preparedness and left Okha. Vidyut was tasked to cover the retreat of the ships after completion of the operation, while the other two missile boats, Veer and Nipat, escorted by Kiltan and Kachal, joined up shortly. The three missile boats, after getting fueled up by Poshak, the fuel barge, and with Kiltan and Kachal as escorts, began closing Karachi. 
during the transit the ships had to carry out communication amongst themselves to ensure a coordinated strike and they did that in russian language so that they do not give away their plans to the listening pakistani radios at 11 at night when the ships were roughly 60 kilometers short the missile boats detected the presence of pakistani ships and began firing pns khyber was the first casualty and nirghat had drawn first blood veer and nipath charged on and sank pakistani naval minesweeper muhafiz and merchant ship venus challenger which were reportedly carrying ammunition for pakistan's forces but the strike group was far from finished the ships quickly retreated but not before veer fired her remaining missiles at the port and set the kiamari oil field ablaze pakistan air force in a desperate attempt to score a hit attacked and damaged their own naval ships operation trident had been a resounding success so incredible was the operation at sea on 4th of december that the day continues to be celebrated as navy day in our country viewers not just trident but the series of victories that indian navy scored over the next 10 days both in the west and east make 1971 war a landmark event in the saga of our service the success of trident led us to the next phase of the war the objectives were threefold trishul and talwar would escort missile boat vinash for second missile attack on karachi the cruiser mysore in company of frigates betwa and ranjit meanwhile would carry out simultaneous diversionary strikes on other minor ports along the coast of makran and tanker deepak and corvette kadmat were to continue contraband control on 8th december 1971 the ships proceeded for their respective objectives karachi strike group which consisted of vinash talwar and trishul proceeded to execute the attack on karachi to mislead the pakistan defenses the group attacked from a southwesterly direction and detected some electronic transmissions from an enemy intelligence ship masquerading as a trawler they suspected that their position had been compromised trishul immediately detected and destroyed the ship before closing again in the formation at about 11 at night the ships were close enough and launched their missiles in the destruction that followed kiamari oil field was further damaged amongst the ships pakistan navy tanker dhaka and merchant ship harmaton sustained heavy damages another merchant ship gulf star was sunk retaliatory fire by the pakistan's anti aircraft gun caused a lot of neutral and collateral damage for the enemy testament to the success of this operation is in the fact that karachi had been completely strangulated and pakistan navy was asked to remove all ammunition and fuel from on board to limit the damage in case indian navy chose to strike again the exploits of western fleet of the indian navy in the arabian sea was reported by global media in great detail it indeed was indian navy's finest hour viewers before i address this graphic on the screen it is important to note that the success of operation trident and python are rooted in the several other tactical battles that the indian navy won in the arabian sea displayed here is a concise diary of event on a reconstructed track chart of the western fleet in arabian sea operation trident where missile boats undertook a blitzkrieg attack on karachi operation python which consisted of the second missile attack from a southwesterly direction and a simultaneous diversionary strike on the makran coast which resulted in the capture of merchant ship madhumati a pakistan cargo vessel further south off the coast of kerala indian naval ship godavari captured another pakistan merchant ship pasni which was carrying contraband items to east pakistan the story of the naval war in the west is incomplete without mentioning the tragic episode of sinking of khukri the ship along with kirpan was undertaking search and attack operations hunting for the pakistani submarines in arabian sea the inherent disadvantage of a lesser sonar range did not deter the ships in undertaking this daunting task unfortunately the ship was detected by the pakistani submarine hangor and fired upon the torpedo struck the ship and she soon sank captain mahendra nath malla the commanding officer of the ship in keeping with the highest naval tradition went down with his ship 
after valiantly helping several crew members escape the raging inferno. For this, the officer was awarded the Mahavir Chakra, the second highest gallantry award of the country posthumously. The Navy in these 10 days had struck a decisive blow at the war waging ability of Pakistan. Pakistan's Navy had been crippled and Karachi had been completely strangulated. In addition, Western fleet had established complete sea control in the Arabian Sea, ensuring safety of our own ports and freedom of our own supply routes. These thumping victories in the West well complemented the heroics of Indian Navy in the East. I'd now hand over the proceedings back to Ira to take us forward to the Eastern chapter of the Indian Navy's operation in 1971. Over to you, Ira. Ooh, that build-up definitely has me sitting at the edge of my seat, and I absolutely cannot wait to hear more. Next, we have Lieutenant Commander Lalitya, who has found the key to time travel. That's right, she can spend hours in a museum, lost in the relics of history, and secretly hopes to be able to live in one. Her bucket list also includes whizzing through the streets of Monaco in a Formula One car. So let's call this globe trotter to transport us back to the Eastern theater of the war and recreate the exploits of INS Vikrant and her battle group. Thank you, Ira. Good evening, viewers. Now that Lieutenant Commander Anand has given us a detailed description of the exciting events of the naval operations that took place on the Western Front during the war, I will take you through the series of events lesser known to most of you, but events that were extremely vital to the positive outcome of the war, operations on the Eastern Theater. Before I delve into the details of the major operations that took place on the Eastern Front, I must tell you that the Eastern Front was formed on 1st of November 1971, just a few weeks before the onset of the war. Due to the distances involved between the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, there had been proposals over the years for the formation of a separate Eastern Fleet with its base at Vishakhapatnam. Since 1965, the Pakistan had pro progressively built up her navy with a capability to interfere with our maritime interests both in the Arabian Sea and in the Bay of Bengal. All these considerations must have played on the minds of our policy framers to favor the formation of a separate Eastern Fleet as soon as conditions permitted. And well, what are the conditions than circumstances leading to a war? So, in the Eastern Fleet, we had the majestic Inus Vikrant, India's first aircraft carrier, along with Seahawks, Elysees, and Elouette helicopters, which operated off of her deck. The Seahawks carried anti-ship rockets that could have devastating effects. Her Elysees could, in addition to rockets, carry 1,000-pound bombs, drop depth charges, lay mines, provide radar pickets, and carry out medium-range reconnaissance. Her Elouette helicopters were instrumental in conducting search and rescue operations. What is interesting to note here is that at the time of inception of the Eastern Fleet, Inus Vikrant was specifically deployed to Vishakhapatnam to be a part of the newly formed Eastern Fleet. And incidentally, viewers, this year also marks the Golden Jubilee of the Eastern Fleet. The fleet also constituted the mites of frigates such as Inus Brahmaputra, Bias, anti submarine frigates INS Kamorta and Kavarati, the destroyer INS Rajput, and landing ship tanks INS Magar, INS Ghadiyal, and INS Guldar. The tasks for the fleet, as ordered, were grand in their brevity and simplicity to seek and destroy enemy naval units at sea, to destroy his bases so that enemy naval units could not get shore support to establish a blockade of the East Pakistan coast and to establish contraband control. The Pakistan Navy, on the other hand, had deployed her most potent and silent killer, PNS Ghazi, to target the aircraft carrier, Inus Vikrant. The Pakistan Navy had also launched four other ships, namely Raj Shahi, Silhet, Komila, and Jasor, 
along with numerous small gunboats and three Daphne class submarines to protect the ports in East Pakistan. In the wake of Pakistan Army's brutal military crackdown Operation Searchlight, the Bengalis were determined to fight for liberation and were willing to be trained in guerrilla warfare. The then Director of Naval Intelligence, Captain Mihir Roy and Admiral Nanda orchestrated the training of hundreds of naval commandos from the ranks of East Bengali Freedom Fighters at a secret facility in Plasi on the banks of the river Bhagirathi. Eight Bengali submariners assigned to a Pakistani submarine docked in France flew down to India with the help of Indian diplomats on learning the atrocities being committed on their fellow Bengalis. Their arrival was providential as they were already trained in warfare and they were made the leaders of Operation X. The first salvo by the commandos between 14th and 15th of August in 1971 resulted in the blowing up of ships, support vessels and port infrastructure vital to the Pakistani military. The 457 Bengali commandos destroyed nearly 100 thousand tons of ships in the sea and river ports of East Pakistan between August and December 1971. The debris disrupted shipping while sustained sabotage by the naval commandos kept merchant ships away, leaving Pakistani troops demoralized and woefully short of vessels to bolster the war effort in the East. In fact, viewer, this story of a world-class covert maritime operation, which was untold for almost five decades, was finally published in a book called Operation X, the untold story of India's covert naval war in East Pakistan, co-authored by Captain M. N. R. Samant and Sandeep Unnithan. As I narrate this story to you, some of you might recall the visuals of a cat and mouse game that ensued between two submarines of enemy nations in the depths of Bay of Bengal, as portrayed in the famous Bollywood movie from 2017, The Ghazi Attack. While of course the plot was loosely based on the events of 1971, let me take this opportunity to explain to you how reality actually unfolded. To begin with, all thanks to the planning and strategic deployment of ships by the Indian Navy, PNS Ghazi never even came close to unleashing herself onto any of the Indian units. Indian naval planners had already ascertained that the Pakistan Navy was likely to target our strongest asset, Inas Vikrant, as her loss was bound to cause serious detriment to the morale of the Indian forces. The Pakistan Navy had deployed her most lethal submarine to neutralize the mother, Inas Vikrant. Vice Admiral Krishnan, the then Commander-in-Chief of the Eastern Naval Command, meticulously planned a careful tactical move whereby he ordered that majority of the Eastern fleet, including Inas Vikrant, be sailed out to the Andaman Islands. Meanwhile, an environment was created at the harbour such that the enemy would perceive her target, Inas Vikrant, to be at Vishakhapatnam. With high demands of ration being catered for and heavy operational communication being maintained, Inas Rajput, the kingpin of this plan, was stationed at Vishakhapatnam, masqueraded as Inas Vikrant in a move to deceive the Pakistan Navy and lure Ghazi to her ultimate end. The Pakistanis fell prey to the master plan and deployed PNS Ghazi off Vishakhapatnam harbour. A total blackout was ordered, hoping that probably the enemy would be foolhardy to be on the surface in search of her prey. On the night of the 3rd of December, the commanding officer of Inez Rajput thought what he saw was a severe disturbance in the water about half a mile ahead of its course. He rightly assumed that this might be a submarine diving, so he closed on to the position at speed and dropped two depth charges. Later, a massive explosion was heard and it was quite enough to say that the fate of the Ghazi was sealed forever. And the same was later established after undertaking diving operations that PNS Ghazi was indeed neutralized. Thus, viewers, within five hours of the first strike by Pakistan against our airfields, Pakistan paid a very heavy price and lost the largest 
and the most prestigious submarine of her navy. More blows were soon to follow that would send the enemy reeling to surrender. Undeterred by the presence of PNS Ghazi in the Bay of Bengal, Ines Vikrant, along with her escorts, sailed out from the Andaman Islands on the 2nd of December towards Cox's Bazar and Chittagong to carry out air raids on airfields, harbour and other military assets of East Pakistan. On 4th of December, at 1100 hours, Ines Vikrant flew off eight Seahawks in her first sortie against the enemy. As a result of the attacks by the aircraft, the airfield was severely damaged and the air traffic control at Cox's Bazar was set on fire. Admiral Sarma reckoned that Pakistanis would have had the news of attack on Cox's Bazar and would probably not anticipate another attack till dusk as attacks from the air are carried out at dawn and dusk when the attacking aircraft are well camouflaged against the darkened skies and least vulnerable to anti-aircraft guns. And so, on the same afternoon, in a daring surprise attack, taking the enemy completely unaware, Chittagong was attacked. The aircraft went on to damage two Pakistani naval gunboats, six merchant vessels, and also set the fuel dump ablaze. On the 6th of December, the airstrikes demolished the harbours of Mongla, Chalna, and Khulna, leaving a wake of destruction in its path. Air raids by aircraft from Vikrant continued from the 9th of December all the way through 13th of December at various military targets in East Pakistan. On the 14th of December, several Seahawks participated in the raids on Chittagong, setting fire to several army barracks in the cantonment area. The initial orders to the fleet had envisaged a total of about five aircraft sorties, but the Navy ended up carrying close to 100 sorties before Vikrant left her area of operations. It is fair to record that but for the presence of the aircraft carrier Ines Vikrant and her aircraft, the tasks assigned to the Eastern Fleet could have probably not been achieved. This clearly illustrates that the power quotient increases manifold when an aircraft carrier is part of a fleet. Flashed on the screen is one such event immortalized in the war diary of Ines Vikrant. The Indian Navy has among various age-old traditions a tradition of painting the names of destroyed targets at a prominent part of a ship to record her kills. Seen on the slide is the list of targets painted on the side of Ines Vikrant which she and her aircraft had destroyed in the 1971 war. By the end of the war, Ines Vikrant and her battle group had neutralized 11 merchant ships and naval ships Silhet, Jessore and Komila. With the air support from Ines Vikrant, Ines Brahmaputra, Beas, Kamorta and Kavarati were carrying out other crucial operations such as anti-submarine, anti-air protection and sea control. Ines Kamorta and Ines Kavarati were the latest ships in our inventory at the time and together these ships provided anti-air and anti-submarine warfare capabilities and were surface escorts to Ines Vikrant. While Ghazi was neutralized, there is a possibility that Pakistani or Allied submarines were deployed in the Bay of Bengal. There are indications of Indian naval ships having submarine contact and taking resolute anti-submarine action. While that mystery may or may not get solved sometime in the future, what needs to be emphasized is that a fleet at sea needs to be constantly at guard against air and submarine attacks and surface radars. Apart from all this, these ships also carried out boarding operations on board various merchant vessels in order to prohibit East Pakistan from receiving any assistance whatsoever from other sea assets. By the time the Eastern Fleet concluded its operations, the Navy had altogether taken as prize 15 merchant ships, some Pakistani carrying troops, others working for Pakistan, and escorted all of them to Calcutta. While the Vikrant, with its 2,000 plus crew and her aircraft, was actively engaged in destroying the enemy, there were other operations that were happening parallelly, which ensured a swift and a decisive victory. Some of these tales are of absolute dare and valor, 
and one such story is of course alpha which included the ins panvel gunboats padma and palash and bsf watercraft chitrangada a disparate group assembled from limited resources braved challenges and risked capture by sailing into the backwaters of east pakistan to carry out raids on chalna khulna and mongla this daring and audacious deep penetration strike led by commander mnr samant resulted in successful attacks on the enemy river and ports launched a counter offensive against enemy forces early on during the war the indian navy and air force had established superiority over the counterparts in east pakistan and so there was no way for the escaping pakistani troops other than crossing the land order border with burma to prevent this escape one battalion of the indian army was to undertake landing at cox's bazar an operation was conceived in order to land army troops at cox's bazar with the help of indian naval ships the operation was code named beaver and was undertaken by ins ghadial ins guldar and mv vishwavidya on the 16th of december and a total of 6 Hundred army troops were landed at Cox's Bazar. With all the enemy ships immobilized and establishment of control over merchant traffic near East Pakistan, the Indian Navy achieved complete supremacy over the enemy in the Bay of Bengal. One submarine and three ships of Pakistan Navy were sunk in various operations during the engagement in the East. The Indian Navy had effectively prevented the escape of Pakistani troops. from sea routes which resulted in the capture of 93000 prisoners of war post surrender of east pakistan in the words of admiral s m nanda the success of the navy lay not so much in the sinking of ghazi or the khyber but its but in its ability in the east to deny any supplies reaching the pak forces in the east pakistan and not permitting the defeated pakistan army to escape by the sea This was the first occasion in 1971 when our navy took a significant part in war against Pakistan. The Eastern Fleet certainly lived up to the tasks set to it. The damage we inflicted on enemy ports and ships was profound. Defense correspondents abroad extolled the effective blockade, contraband control, and bombardment carried out by the Indian Navy. The Indian Navy clearly emerged as a force. to be reckoned with i hope that you dear viewers now know a little bit more of the lesser known tales of the might the capability and the ingenuity of the indian navy thank you shamno varnaha jai hind i am just going to think out loud for a second who was behind our victory what effect did it have and what happened after all of this fear not dear viewers for lieutenant commander rishikesh joshi will now answer all of these burning questions aira aira thanks for having me here oh you are here already i was just going to introduce you I've heard that you write songs and are also an excellent lawn tennis player. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, writing and especially songwriting is my passion, and sports, of course, of course, is a big part of armed forces lifestyle. I love it. Yeah, well, most of us struggle to even get out of bed. How did you even manage to find time for all of this research? Well, we studied the Seventy One War during our academy days. and the courage the persistence the mental resolve of the men had a huge impact on me later as a student of leadership i found that 17 war is really inspiring i am really happy that i am a part of this and i am really excited so what are we waiting for i will leave you to it sure sure thanks again hello and good evening everyone now that we're going to speak about the men you would have heard of visionary army leader field marshal sai manik shah possible and many of you also know the battle of longewala let us now talk about the naval leaders who displayed courage and exemplary leadership at sea you know going back to my academy days i now remember the training and how hard it was 
but we were taught that the most potent weapon that any navy or any armed forces can have is its men manzil unhi ko milti hai jinke sapno mein jaan hoti hai pankhon se zyada kuch nahi hota hausla se udan hoti hai that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this section the leaders their actions the decisions their courage their actions which win the wars and not the weapons so who were these amazing people who made all the magic happen the core team at naval headquarters comprised of chief of the naval staff along with the vice chief the director of operations and the director of intelligence the chief of the naval staff admiral sardar iral mathralas nanda was a man of big ideas and swift decisions in fact as early as 2 years before the war in 1969 he had stated and i quote i grew up in karachi and therefore i know the harbor very well the navy will make the biggest bonfire out of it when the opportunity comes and he lived up to his words during the war that showed his resolve and metal another factor was that the navy was tasked with predominantly defensive role in 65 war navy could not unleash its full potential as a land borders were the ones facing direct hostility but admiral nanda knew that the offensive deployment of navy would be a critical factor if east pakistan was to be liberated he knew that karachi plays a vital role in pakistan's strategic foundation and therefore was a critical target let's watch a small video that shows his thought pradhanmantri indira gandhi ne yuddh ki taiyariyon par charcha ke liye teeno sena pramukhon ki ek baithak bulayi nau sena ke tatkalin commander in chief admiral एस एम नंदा का विचार था कि कराची को निशाना बनाना चाहिए कराची न केवल पाकिस्तान नौसेना का मुख्यालय था बल्कि पाकिस्तान की अर्थव्यवस्था की रीढ़ भी था पाकिस्तान के समुद्री केंद्र कराची पर नौसेना की नाकाबंदी करके उनकी अर्थव्यवस्था को नष्ट करने का अंतिम उद्देश्य convinced her of his plan and got her approval this plan was also really innovative the use of missile boats for offense had the biggest element of surprise utilization of the aircraft carrier for bombardment and offensive role in the east worked out amazingly well for us whether it be authorization of operation x and training of mukti bahini or be it marshaling of the resources and sustaining the highest morale for the rank and file she made it all happen but admiral nanda was not alone the vice chief of naval staff admiral jal kasid ji was there with him you can think of admiral nanda like spirited aggressive captain of the team someone like virat kohli and their admiral kasid ji as calm methodical vice captain like ajink kirhane balancing the scales filling in the minute details the director of operations captain stanley dawson and the director of intelligence captain mihir kumar roy also formed the integral part of this team these four can be fittingly called the brains of the naval operations Admiral Kasid Ji had a major share in employing fishing boats in the role never thought before. The brilliant idea of use of fishing boats to report any suspicious activity and to become eyes and ears of navy was his. Not only fishing, but he also had the foresight in managing the narrative for international cargo ships in the area of conflict. The effects of damage to the neutrals would be devastating chain reaction involving several international players. This crucial aspect of policy towards the neutrals and merchant ships in the area was handled by Admiral Kasid Ji. Now falling under the gambit of clandestine operations and naval intelligence was Operation X. Director of Naval Intelligence Captain Mihir Kumar Roy was the brains behind it. It was again the most novel way of innovative thought in empowering Mukti Bahini to undertake the operations under the overhang of Indian Navy. So the bulk of operations and planning coordination took part in the naval headquarters at delhi the field formations also witnessed outstanding leadership in the west the difficult task of attacking the pakistani citadel karachi was entrusted to vice admiral surendranath kohli and rear admiral elangikil chandi kurvela not only that they also had the onerous task to protect our own trade simultaneously ensuring a dominance across the huge expanse of arabian sea despite ins vikrant going to the east working up the remaining fleet along with the newly inducted missile boats for the first time was an extremely difficult task that these two fine men successfully shouldered their prompt action of sailing out of ships on 2nd december within 24 hours of receiving receiving the orders proved very crucial in landing the first punch operations at sea were coordinated by admiral kurevela himself embarked on the flagship ins masur 
which was commanded by Captain Rustam K. Gandhi. The required coordination of all the operations was done from here, and protecting of the small missile boats was undertaken by the bigger ships such as INS Talwar and INS Kachal. The missile boats achieved successful firing of the newly acquired P-15 missiles. And given the tactical complications and scarcity of the operation and training, this indeed was an incredible achievement. It was like taking the final exam within weeks of getting the syllabus. But Commander Babruvan Yadav aced that exam as a squadron commander of the missile boats. There were many other units that contributed. Flash now are the names of the commanding officers of Western Fleet units that were deployed during this war. Now, while the Western Fleet was busy attacking Karachi, let's see who handled the Eastern Front. Vice Admiral Neelkanth Krishnan was Commander in Chief, and Rear Admiral Sri Harilal Sharma was the Fleet Commander. Together, they made a formidable duo on fleet operations of the Navy. Admiral Krishnan, as early as in November 71, emphasized the importance of employing the carrier in their offensive role. INS Vikrant and its sterling role in liberating Bangladesh draws its credit from the foresight of Admiral Krishnan. The aircraft carrier was commanded by Captain Swaraj Prakash, who in spite of low wind operations and issues with aircraft launching catapult, made every mission a success, performing way beyond anyone's expectations. And the story of Vikrant has come incomplete without mentioning Commander Binarai Chaudhary the engineering officer on board. He made the seemingly impossible task of getting the fourth boiler operational without any external help. Having various defects at sea, which actually would have needed support of dockyards, during the long and demanding sailing and making the aircraft operations possible is credited to this fine engineering officer. Speaking of aircraft operations, Lieutenant Commander S.K. Gupta was a daredevil who, as a Seahawk squadron commander, led many successful sorties. On the other hand, Lieutenant Commander Ravi Dheer led the Elize squadron that undertook maritime reconnaissance and bombing operations during the night to render the enemy in airfields un completely unusable. Lieutenant Commander Inder Singh on board INS Rajput successfully implemented the plan of deception to ensure the safety of our carrier. Let's watch a small video about the effect that this had later in the war. INS Vikrant, with minimal resources from the Eastern Fleet, had successfully carried out the unprecedented task of enforcing total blockade within 48 hours and continued to control the area for the entire duration of the war. The enemy spirit and morale was shattered by the incessant strikes and bombings, which continued till the 10th of December. So while the air operations have their importance, the leaders on the ground also had a difficult task. The waters of East Pakistan were haphazardly mined by the enemy forces. Commander Mohan Narayan Rao Samant was the man in charge who took on the extremely risky and complex operation or a covert mission, Operation X, at enemy harbors of Mongla and Kulna. Lieutenant VP Kapil was one of the sector commanders and the man that can be called on ground zero who undertook training of Mukti Bahini men to carry out deadly clandestine attacks, sinking many enemy merchant ships. Now let's have a look at the courageous team who made this extremely difficult and covert operation a success. In the fleet, INS Brahmaputra, commanded by Captain Jagdish Chandra Puri, INS Bias, commanded by Commander Lakshmi Narayan Ramdas, INS Kamurta, commanded by Captain MP Avati. INS Kavarati, commanded by Subir Paul, were the four Eastern Fleet units that operated close to enemy coast and were involved in a range of operations such as anti-air, anti-submarine, surface escorts, and boarding operations. You can now see on your screen some of the other Eastern Fleet units that also participated in the war. So when we now look at this war in a larger perspective, all these amazing people, leaders, and their actions achieved some really crucial outcomes post-71 war. After 1971, navies across the world started looking at Indian Navy with great respect. It established Indian Navy as a force to reckon with in Indian Oceanic region. The citizen of India also realized the might and effectiveness of Indian Navy. 
Look at this letter written by none other than Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that states, and I quote, none of this would have been possible without the most exacting leadership and dedication at all levels. In this, your role has been crucial. No words can be better recompense for your labors than the people's admiration and India's success. Indian Navy practically proved the fundamental role of any Navy that is sea control and showed the world how it's done. The fact that merchant ships in Pakistan taking India's permission to enter or leave says everything. We also boast the highest number of soldiers that surrendered and maximum tonnage of ships sunk in any war post World War II. But ladies and gentlemen, there are so many tales of Vela and courage that this war witnessed that time does not permit me to list all of them. All the people I described only form an illustrative list. A few more are flashed on the screen. I will now stop by saying that these amazing men, these war heroes and their actions brought immense respect to the white uniform and the fine service. They carved a special place in hearts of all the Indians. Thank you. Shanno Varuna Jai Hind. I am sure this has only built up the excitement for the second part of this webinar, the one we've all been waiting for interactions with the heroes themselves who in fact made it all happen i would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of them and hand over to commodore case noor you were riveted by what you heard let me tell you there's something more recollections from those who took part in the war. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you would have seen from the previous presentations that war involved vision at the highest level, flawless execution, great acts of courage and bravery, and often something that we call as the X factor. Now, who better to talk about all these than four people who took part in the war and in different sort of theaters or places. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Commodore M. Bada, who flew the Seahawks that targeted various ports in East Pakistan. We have Commodore S. N. Singh, who was a midshipman on board INS Kokori and survived, and he will tell us the tale of that. We also have with us Captain S.S. Sethi, who was a navigating officer on board INS Petwa, a frontline Western fleet ship that established sea control in the Arabian Sea. And then we have Commander Kapil, who was a training coordinator who made Operation X possible and trained the Mukti Bahini Naval Commanders. You have seen all of their biodatas flashed before this presentation. Now, let us wait and listen to them live. So, can we have our guests on the stage, please? Good evening, sirs. 
it's wonderful to see you all uh, welcome again the honor or shan of this panel has been immensely made larger by your presence so sir what i am going to do is begin with a common question to all of you and then take certain individual questions on your specific area of operation as we saw admiral nanda said let us write a new chapter in our history at that time in 1971 the navy strength was barely 20000 and the officer strength was a little less than 2000 so the four of you were a part of those 2000 officers who wrote a new chapter in history and all of you were young then so i'd like to just begin by asking each one of you how did you feel you were young at that point of time in war and what was the feeling uh, uh, was there some sort of apprehension excitement some heebie jeebies so may i uh, ask uh, may i begin uh, with commodore bada and then ask the others to follow sir thank you shrikant and good evening listeners in the defense forces there is a saying the more you sweat in peace the less you bleed in war it is with this philosophy that from the day you don your uniform till the day you shed it on retirement you are working so that you will bleed less in war fortunately while we may be working very hard in the peace time not all of us are lucky to actually bleed in war here i must admit with some macabreish satisfaction and state that i was fortunate to be at the right place at the right time and to have witnessed the navy's finest hour and the birth of a nation thank you Were in the right place or wrong place in a bit, but but your initial feelings about the war, sir. Sorry, you got cut off, Shrikant. Uh, Commodore Essen Singh, sir, can you hear me? I was I was trying. To but, uh, Commodore Bada said he was in the right place at the right time. Uh, in your case, whether you are in the right place or at the right time uh, needs to be discussed. But could you just? just tell us your initial feelings about the war and whether you are in the right place or the wrong place um actually uh, on the 25th of november uh, the results of the midshipmen's board were uh, announced and since we had come in from different ships from the east coast and uh, the west coast uh so my uh, coursemate midshipman patil said uh, to me he says this uh, and i'm now on the loan on kokri so uh, instead of you going to any other ship why don't you come and join me because i'll uh, be on the loan on board so i said most certainly and uh, i found myself on the 26th of november uh with my baggage reporting on board the kokri and when well, beyond that i know it's all history <laughs> uh wonderful sir you you are in some ways destiny's child you you are not supposed to have gone there you went there on a whim and fancy and the coastmate calling you and then you live to tell us the tale we'll come back to that in a bit uh, so captain sethi sir you you had a different experience you were preparing for war your your engagement was happening and you're not allowed to go uh, for that uh, can you can you briefly tell us as the war clouds were hovering uh, you were not even able to go home and you were preparing for it uh, so so just briefly fill us on that Yeah, thank you, uh, Shrikant. Jai Hind. I go. It is uh, 50 years ago. 
but uh, you know, the three moments are still very, very fresh in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, uh, you know, a fleet of 13 powerful ships that sailed out on the second. And uh, to be very frank with you, we had a very, very careless approach. Because what happened was that we had done so much of training in the month of uh, October and November. We had sailed for a couple of days and come back and we were fully prepared for war at any time. Like uh, Kamlo Bada said earlier, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. And that was the situation. I can just give you my own personal example. After one sailing, I remember 22nd November we came back. Um, it was about 9 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock. And I hit the sack because I hardly slept for the last couple of days. At about uh, in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, my steward come and tell me, Sir, lunch is ready. I said, what do you mean lunch? I should be having dinner. So you can imagine that the amount of uh, training that we did earlier, we were, we were so well trained that the war came in, we were so motivated. And we were totally fearless. There was no fear at all, whatever. You know, we were motivated as well as ready for any eventuality that comes there. We totally bold and resolute. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about my all youngsters, young left at that time. Because we remember our motto of NDA, service before self. And I can tell you very clearly, even if we had to give our life, at that time, we were, we were prepared. There was, there, was, there was no doubt in our mind whatsoever. And our, our aim also was very clear. After seeing the operation order, which we did two days earlier, yeah, we that what we were supposed to do. And one, the aim was very clear. We knew what we were supposed to carry out. Later on, we discussed the attack on Karachi and the blockade that we were uh, leaving the rest inside. So we are we are coming to that part. So we're coming to that part. But I like the way you said we were training. There was no doubt in our mind, and there was complete resolve. Now the three of you were training yourselves, but we had Commander Kapil who was training somebody else. You were training the Mukti Bahini commandos for undertaking clandestine operations. This is the first of its kind. Uh, so, so tell us, I mean, you were suddenly whisked away from Mumbai. You didn't know what you're expecting. Can you fill us a little bit uh, on how you entered that and what were, what were your initial feelings about that? Uh, good evening. Um, as you said, that I was posted in Bombay. I was looking after the fleet diving team there. And uh, as the diving requests go, they come overnight and you, you fly and you just get on with the job. So it was a similar thing. It was a signal from the naval headquarters which uh, summoned me to uh, Calcutta and I was told to go and stay in the army, uh, in the army mess, Fort William, uh, which was a little strange. But anyway, uh, when we went there, I found uh, Director of Naval uh, Intelligence and uh, my uh, course mate Samir Das, a fellow diver, uh, waiting there and uh, I was told briefly what to, uh, to be expected out of me and what the plans were. So initially, I'm like, you know, it, it, it sounded like a very mundane job, but uh, now in retrospect, uh, when I look back at it, I think I was very privileged to have been selected for that. And I'm very proud to have been in the uh, team of brilliant uh, men uh, wearing, the Dolphin, uh, wearing the diver's badge. Uh, thanks, sir. We'll be coming to the exploits of the diving branch in a little bit. Uh, so, so if I can go back to Komodo Bada, uh, so there was there was some great thing happening on the ground, some frisson, but here you are preparing on the aircraft carrier, you're doing uh, training. And then when you're called upon to go to war, uh, all of you were ready for it. Now, the excitement of the war was such that uh, I heard, sir, that you had actually a dislocated shoulder, but despite that, because of problems, you wanted to fly and you actually fought with your doctor so that you could get the go ahead. Can, can you tell us a bit about that part, uh, you know, how, how, how you were desperate to fly and, and through that, tell how did your squadron achieve everything that it had set out to achieve?
Uh, sir, you need to unmute, sir. You need to unmute. You need to unmute. Uh, 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 Commander Bada, you need to unmute, sir. Yeah, as I said, Srikant, uh, that was only mentioned to you in passing in good humor, but it is true. Um, we have been working up towards this final attempt for many months in the on the eastern seaboard in the bay of bengal um, and finally towards the end ianis vikrant with her escorts was um, anchored in a bay of port cornwallis in uh, the north andaman islands awaiting instructions and orders to proceed obviously when as you know when the ships are in harbor the pilots are at large and um, one thing leads to another. And on this particular occasion in the evening, I dislocated my shoulder. Now here I must pause for a moment and uh, apprise you that this was not one off dislocation. I had been suffering from a recurring dislocation, sh shoulder, left shoulder, even before I joined the National Defense Academy. With this, unperceivable physical disability, I may, not, I may call it. I went through the NDA, I went through all my flying time, I went through all my training time for the simple reason that I had developed an uncanny and a very quick act of a procedure of resetting it very, very quickly without anybody even knowing that I dislocated my shoulder. But I must also admit here that Every single individual whom I was associated with, starting from my NDA cadets days to the sea cadet day, to the cadet on board the training ship, midshipmen, to my squadrons, to my flying days, everybody knew about this dislocation. But, and I repeat this with a lot of emphasis, that nobody ever ratted on me. Because if that had been so, I would have been on the streets. Obviously, with this kind of a disability of a dislocation of a shoulder, I managed to do that. It just so happened that on that particular evening at Cornwallis Bay, I dislocated my shoulder in the Vikrant's wardroom. And there happened to be sitting a medical officer, an Air Force doctor who had joined us for this operation. He noticed it. He immediately reported it to the principal medical officer, Surgeon, Com Surgeon Commander Christian, who sent for me the next morning and heard the story and then said, I'm afraid I have to ground you. Very, very frightening words indeed at that point of time. Because we are now middle of the ocean in the Andaman Islands, ready to go to war. No chance of a replacement as far as the squadron is concerned, as far as the ship is concerned. And for me, it was out of the flying branch. You can imagine now the state of mind that I was going through. Fortunately, this was appreciated. The lack of an operational pilot on board at this critical juncture was appreciated by the commanding officer of my, my squadron commander, Gigi Gupta who immediately took up the case with the captain of the ship, commander air, captain, everybody. Everybody tried to convince Surgeon Commander Christian, but he remained adamant for quite some time. Finally, the fleet commander, Admiral Sarma, had to intervene and had to request Commander Christian to allow me to fly the operational sorties on the condition that I will have myself treated soon after the operations are over. Commander Christian, not satisfied, made me sit in a cockpit and made me do all the drills I would have to do whilst flying an operational sortie. And I had to convince him that at no stage in the cockpit am I going to use that left shoulder to such an extent that it would get dislocated. He was convinced. And with that, he cleared me for flying just a day before the Seahawks were launched, in which I was in the first sort of Bazaar.
Yes. So yes. Th that's, that's needless, such to a... say, needless to say, at the end of the operations, in the euphoria of the victory, all was forgotten and I never got myself operated to date. <laughs> that, that's such a wonderful story. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Commodore Bada is telling this in a very typical uh, self-deprecatory manner. But can you imagine what it is to fly a fighter aircraft with a dislocated shoulder and go and bombard the enemy? This is war. Uh, but that's typical of many naval officers. Now, let me turn my attention, therefore, to Commodore S.N. Singh. Uh, he was there on Kokri the night it got torpedoed. So let's get a sense of drama of what happened on the Kukri that night. Essence, sir, uh, can you just describe it for all of us? Yeah. Uh, that evening, I was doing first watch, and uh, yeah, I dozed up. <clears throat> And uh, usual thing, taking a fix, fix the ship. And uh, in the in the in the bridge, we had the uh, captain, we had uh, uh, Defense Commander Jane, the uh, scientist from the BARC who had uh, put the modification on our sonar the uh, XO, the uh, SCO, various other officers all around the um, uh, captain that are discussing um, how to operate with a major modification on there on the sonar. And at that time, we had uh, also the uh, news summary, five minute news summary, 8.45. Uh, or India Radio, war news coming in. And uh, I just put on the fix, turned around, and the first hit. There's this massive explosion, but, uh, and uh, uh, a massive uh, explosion, but underwater. It wasn't a direct hit. And uh, immediately, uh, the uh, radar PPI bloomed and shut down. I turned around, looked, and uh, you know the sailors were, uh, or the watchkeepers, uh, the lookouts. Uh, they started uh, wondering, "Kya ho gaya?" The uh, captain was in the chair, in his chair. Uh, he asked uh, the EXO and uh, the other officers, go and see what's happened. And immediately I started, we saw that the ship had started listing to starboard and going down by the stern. Then I was, I remained in the bridge. Gradually, uh, people were started shouting and saying, listing, uh, um, uh, stern say, niche ho ra hai. And uh, there were these uh, personnel trying to come up to the bridge with the dice jackets. There were people trying to go back uh, to get their dice jackets. And uh, Gradually, the uh, the list kept increasing. The uh, stern kept going down, and uh, as the list list kept increasing, more and more people coming up on, started falling down to the starboard sides in the water. Captain remained sitting. But yes, to see that it was becoming slightly uncomfortable. And at the same time, uh, I realized he had hurt himself because of the explosion. Hurt himself on the uh, head. Uh, but mm -hmm. Captain remained cool, kept 
telling the guys hmm? now uh, yes. get into the life jackets, hmm. get into the water, remain cool throughout. And uh, when there were no lights, there was no intercommunication, nothing at all. And uh, when I would say in about two or three minutes' time, uh, when the uh, bridge was almost um, um, vertical and we were on the side, south side, I decided to leave on the port side, the higher side. Uh, captain was still sitting, but he was kind of on, on the side, he was standing actually, he wasn't sitting on the chair anymore. And you've been telling the sailors, you guys go, seemed as if he had made up his mind, I am not leaving. Anyway, so I uh, left from the port side. There were some other communication sailors who left from the port side. Uh, by the time I jumped into the water, it was actually walking in the water because the it was uh, almost the, in the bridge and the, the stern had gone down totally. So and uh, uh, wait, uh, that was it. I uh, got right. into the water, uh, you know, uh, looked around. Uh, there was uh, uh, something white. One of the guys he found it floating around. He said, Yeah, Rassi Patani Kasi is one of the sailors. You know, that time we are all in the water. We are Full of, I mean, we are soaked in FFO, furnace fuel oil. Uh, nothing very pleasant to drink at any stage. Um, very oily and dirty, smelling thing, but you know, we had no choice. And then um, this chap says, Ye ek rusty hai. Then I said, Kecho. And then fortunately, he pulled and the first the raft. Uh, inflated. Right. There were about uh, 21 sailors and I myself took some time to get in because, uh, like I said, it was oil, full of oil. Everybody's eyes were full of oil, uh, pitch dark, uh, you know. Uh, well, took some time to get organized in the raft. First of all, we were trying to get in where there wasn't any uh, opening. So, but there were two openings. So, so once the raft had inflated, we knew there were some lights and things. Then, of course, uh, we got comfortable inside. And uh, but it took a bit of time. Right. And uh, then uh, one of the communication sailors uh, turned on and said, ke, uh, ye agar, uh, Submarine hai pass me enemy ka to uh, unko night off karna chahiye. So we removed the, you know, the, there was that um, seawater activated battery light. We removed, switched that off. Um, of course, we had one sailor who obviously watchkeeper in the engine room. He had a super saturated steam pipe bursting behind his back. Oh. And uh, th it was some sight which I never forget. Because uh, when we saw him in the, in the morning was something, but uh, he kept moaning, kept uh, groaning, but of course, we couldn't do much other than give him water to drink. So. And uh, that's how we uh, landed up uh, being picked up by uh, Kripan the next day. Next day. Right, sir. Right, sir. I, I, I saw a very wonderful uh, comment by one of our viewers saying, uh, I know how difficult this must be for Commodore Essencing to recount this. 
and hats off to you. Uh, really, sir, I know how difficult it must be. Uh, so, so hats off to you. Now, uh, let me go to Captain Sethi. Sir, apart from the episode of cookery, uh, the Western fleet, the Navy, as such, dominated the whole war. And the Western fleet in particular played a significant, if silent role, uh, enabling these operations to happen. Uh, as the navigating officer of a uh, lead ship in the Western fleet, uh, you have often spoken about this. In fact, I must thank you for sharing that excellent track chart that you have reproduced of, of the entire Western fleet. Can you tell us a little bit about what that operation meant? Give us a, a, a slightly bigger picture, a bird's eye view of, of the fleet operations from your side and the training that you did. Yeah, yes, she can't. Uh, actually, our aim was uh, very clear when we, uh, you know, the war breaks out. Our aim was very, very clear. Our aim was to seek and destroy the Pakistani warships. That was number one aim. And number two aim was to attack and cripple Karachi Harbor. You know, so that, you know, the East Pakistan doesn't get anything from the West Pakistan. And the third aim was to carry out total blockade to make sure that none of the tankers from the Gulf reach Karachi. Because the tankers don't reach Karachi because every nation has the fuel for a couple of days only. And if they do not have the fuel, they will not be able to function at all. The, the whole nation will come to a standstill. And I think this is what happened. We were able to achieve all the three aims that we had. Now, what happened was that the moment we sailed out on the second and we formed a departure screen trying to skirt the Pakistan submarine, we, we did, uh, myself, ourselves, uh, Betwa and Sushur investigative of submarine co contract. And, but luckily, the war had not broken out. But the moment on the third evening, if you can see on the chart, you can see the we are heading towards we are heading towards the center of Arabian Sea. But what happened was that we were the aircraft picket. We were supposed to we had the long range uh, aircraft uh, radar LR nine six A, and we picked up a, a Pakistani aircraft. We uh. Go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have lost Captain Sethi. I'll come back to him in a bit. Uh, but um, uh, meanwhile, if I can go to uh, Commander Kapil. Uh, sir, uh, the fleet was doing its wonderful things uh, over a long established tradition, doctrines, procedures, sea control. On the other hand, the Navy's diving branch was nascent. It was formed in the 60s. And there, suddenly, you are given this, this sort of huge operation to do. So I think in many ways, 71 was a golden moment for the diving branch, particularly because you people got into action much before the others did. So can you tell us and the viewers a little bit more about how uh, significant a moment this was uh, for the diving branch? Uh, and uh, after I finish with your answer, Kapil, sir, I'll go back to Captain Sethi because we lost him, sir. Uh, go ahead, Kapil, sir. Right. Um, it was, yes, uh, it was opportunity given to this uh, very nascent branch, as you say. Um, we had to uh, really stand up to the task. And we have a handful of us. Uh, you, uh, it is pertinent to mention that at that, that time, the clearance having branch comprised of only eight officers, out of which uh, four were the senior ones who had qualified to the uh, um, 60, uh, 69, our batch of four officers qualified in uh, 70. So suddenly the diving branch officers carder jumped up to 100 per, by 100 um, percent. But the sailor carder of uh, CD sailors was only about 60. So pulling uh, seven, eight sailors out and two officers out was a big dent on the diving branch itself uh, because the fleet diving team, uh, the Fleet diving team, command diving teams of uh, uh, three commands and the diving school had to run. And uh, with the war coming in, uh, the um, chances and the um, apprehensions of, of a cl uh, clandestine, a preemptive attack by the Pakistanis who were known to have two midget submarines which carried chariots 
the chariots themselves are the small wet submarines, as uh, people would know. Um, they, they are driven by the two two divers uh, and carry about uh, 200 kgs of explosive. So they are lethal. So so the the uh, fleets and the harbors have to be protected. So so there was a big daunting task on the whole branch. So here <clears throat> we were given this task to train these. Uh, Muktibaini youngsters. In fact, the youngsters were <coughs> in the age group of about 15 years to, to, to about uh, 20, 20, 22 years. That was the profile we selected. And uh, these, um, the profile which we set in was that they should be semi-educated so that uh, they could understand the intricacies of uh, explosive workup, the um, explosive ordnance and uh, the, the uh, other things associated with it. And we, we were given the mandate of uh, training them within three weeks as, as a full-fledged full uh, clandestine swimmer. Uh, since the diving um, underwater clandestine approach was not possible, it was the surface approach was taken uh, because we, we, uh, we, we had to churn out so many um, uh, operators. So here the uh, daunting task was that our instructors, the sailors and us, or three of us, were busy, say about 10 to 12 hours a day in actual workout. So so a day started pretty early, it standard, ended up pretty late, and so about 14, 15 hours every day continuously. So in, in three weeks, when you pretty, uh, you know, sort of work them up, and uh, make them into some kind of uh, entity who could go and attack the enemy harbor. Um, the fresh lot came in, and fresh lots are coming. So you, you can imagine, by the time we had set up, I had set up the camp somewhere in third of uh, or fourth of uh, May, '71, and um, till Left Commander Martis joined in June, uh, we had already about sixty odd youngsters getting trained into the into the craft. So the um, moment these uh, 15 days were over for this batch, three weeks were over for this batch, the new batch came in and, and the batches were continuously coming. So uh, it was a continuous process. The moment they com completed three weeks training, they were put on to work up with the same gang and uh, they, they got into more and more confidence into to remaining on, uh, in the water and the techniques which we're teaching, which um, continued uh, till about uh, July. And July is the time when uh, our bosses from the uh, Naval Headquarters told us that uh, it's the time now, select the best lot of 160 lot, 60 boys who will be attacking uh, the uh, uh, targets in uh, East Pakistan. And the targets chosen were um, four harbors, Chittagong, Kulna Chhala Mongla area, which were the two main ports of um, East Pakistan at that time, Narayan Ganj and uh, Chandpur, which was um, uh, smaller ports, but they were very important because uh, all the um, shipping, all the men and material moved through the river and route in East Pakistan. So, um, the draft restrictions were about 9 to about 12 feet in uh, Chittagong and um, Chala Mongla area, while in Chanpur it was about 4 to 6. So um, from um, Chittagong, the men and material were shifted into smaller boats, came to um, the, these mini carry, mini bulk carriers of 2,500 tonnes. They came to Chanpur and Narayan Ganj. And that's where they shifted into, um, uh, offloaded into much lighter crafts of say about 200 tonners, 300 tonners, and then they moved. All the, all the route, the riverine route, which formed <clears throat> from Chittagong to Kulna and uh, Chittagong to Dhaka, they yes. were a ring around the cantonments of uh, East Pakistan. So the supplies and the men could be supplied continuously. So that's why these four ports were chosen. And uh, by about um, 
the first week of uh, August, they had moved out into the launching pads, which were um, in um, Kalyani near Barakpur, well, for the uh, Chola Chala Mongla area, and to Agartala for Chandpur, Naran Ganj, and Chittagong. So these people started, as you know, the attack took place on the 14th, 15th. 14th, 15th of August. So, so, so you chose uh, you chose perhaps a perfect sort of date for uh, Operation Jackpot, and subsequently you sank huge amount of shipping. I'll come come back to that, sir. Uh, sure. Captain Seti, we lost you at the point where you said you had the largest range radar in the Western Fleet. So can you can you go further from that point uh, and explain to our viewers uh, uh, about the Western Fleet? Uh, uh, the r radar detection and, and how you kept kept them uh, uh, yeah, under yeah. surveillance. Yes, Shrikant, what happened was on the third evening when the war broke out, we were exactly about 150 miles south of Karachi, as you can see on the chart. And we had this aircraft, Pakistani aircraft, who was tracking us from behind. Now, what the fleet, uh, you know, the fleet commander, he took a very, very nice appropriate action. Otherwise, if the aircraft would have not been there, it would be on the same day of war. We might have been gone in and attacked Karachi that day only. But then, as you see on the chart, we went on a southwesterly direction. And we all, 13 ships, broke up in different groups. And the aircraft got so confused, it was could be to the, it was one of the Pakistani airline aircraft also, manned by the naval personnel. But they got so confused that he, he eventually didn't know whom to track. In the meantime, you know, then because for the whole time thereafter, we maneuvered ourselves so well that till the end of the operation, till the war finished, no Pakistani aircraft could detect us. I can tell you that if, for example, we were detected by the Pakistani reconnaissance aircraft, the whole war story would have been entirely different. We would have come under attack by the Pakistani jet aircraft, and we might even have some casualties. We might even have a couple of casualties. But the fleet was maneuvered so well by the fleet commander that thereafter we kept uh, a second section went in and did an attack on Karachi because we had moved south and it became such a big surprise for Pakistan. Pakistan Navy thought, Pakistan, uh, they all thought that we had gone well to the south. And then suddenly the other group, which you see on the chart, the one of the red ink, that group of two Patriot three missile boats went and attacked Karachi on the fourth and fifth night. Now they were quite surprised that they thought the Western fleet had gone well to the south and from where we should come in. And that Trident attack was a very after one day of the war breaking out. And as you, you already explained earlier, their Khyber the ship that sank. And I must tell you over here that they never expected that we will attack them with, with missile boats because missile boats are defensive boats. Even Russians are very surprised. The Russians also have made these uh, missile boats only for defending the harbors. These missile boats are supposed to defend the harbor, and if any attacking ship comes in, they're supposed to go and engage the ship and don't allow her to attack that harbor. In our case, we towed our missile boats and bend into right into enemy's uh, cartel, we went right into enemy's port, and we destroyed the ship right into the day. I mean, they, and even for example, Khabar that day, he made a signal, I'm under air attack. He never That's ever right. could think that missile boat has come over there and attacked the missile. So what happened thereafter, what, we went in south, and then later on, we came for a second attack in Karachi. That is by Talwar, Trishul, and Vinash on the 8th and 9th night from the westerly side. Now, that was again a surprise because the first attack on Karachi was from the from the south easterly side, and the next attack came from the south westerly side. And these two attacks really crippled. And what happened was that we already destroyed uh, one main ship of theirs, uh, Khyber had been destroyed, Mahafiz had been destroyed. We had been uh, made in Mumbai, and the Pakistan what they did was after their attack, they took all the ships inside the port. 
And can you imagine that they told all the ships to de-evolution? Can you imagine during wartime, a, a, a Navy in the wartime telling a ship to de-evolution because they knew that if one more attack comes in and with a ship full of ammunition, if the missile comes and hits the ship, they'll blow up the whole harbor. And what yes, happened was that one of the missiles which uh, hit uh, the oil farm, the Air Force used to keep coming in, putting their uh, bombs over there. And the Karachi was used to see burning for days. For seven days, the Karachi could be seen burning. I will talk to you about blockade then later then. Right, yeah, sir. Right, sir. I think, I think you made a very, very important point when you say that effectively uh, by the 8th after the Python, when Pakistan told their ships not merely to get back into harbor, but the ammunition. I think you're making a very significant point that they had given up by then. And, and but for the incident at Kukri, uh, uh, Western Front was more or less secured uh, by the 8th. Uh, so, so that's a good time now to go to East where uh, uh, Commodore Bada and his people, his friends were relentlessly bombarding uh, the ports of Bangladesh, uh, even as Commander Kapil and the people that he was training were targeting them from the diverse side. So Bada sir, uh, can you again, I want to, uh, while, while talking about the overall bravery of Seahawks and the Elises, and the Elises did a lot, I would like you to talk a bit about the Elises. I would also ask you to uh, uh, to briefly recollect that personal incident of yours where uh, you were the tail end Charlie and you were a little delayed uh, because one of your, I think, your guns did not fire. First time you took a, uh, one more circuit to fire and there was lots of worry in the fleet about whether you had come back or not. So, so can you fill us on that detail? Uh, uh, because yeah. it's personal drama, it's suspense. Yeah, sure. I'll try and be as brief as I can. Uh, first, of course, about the air operations. Uh, you know, um, the Seahawks were uh, programmed and uh, detailed to carry out strikes on various shore establishments. First, starting with Cox's Bazaar, with the explicit instructions of destroying the airfield at Cox's Bazaar and rendering it unusable by the enemy. Uh, we carried out attacks, uh, bombing attacks to make craters in the runway. We also carried out strafing attacks and we carried out rocket projectile attacks on installations like the control tower, the communication installations, the fuel dumps, etc. Subsequently, we carried out, you know, subsequent sorties. Um, we carried out attacks on shore establishments at Kulna, Chalna, etc. And our concentration was, of course, on Chittagong. Um, we also carried out attacks on ships uh, which were in at the anchorage. And our Elysia aircraft, I must admit, carried out the same exercises by night because they were better equipped to carry out these exercises by night um, and they were very very efficient and I must say they played a very iconic role in uh, the control of the contraband you know we had established a contraband control and it was the Elysees which made sure the ingress and egress of enemy ships was to its minimum during this period I know that about nearly about 15 enemy vessels were caught boarded and escorted all the way to uh, our uh, Indian harbor at Haldia. Uh, as, as I said, we had carried out many uh, attacks, many sorties. Both Elysees did it, the Seahawks did it. Um, and in this particular one which you mentioned, um, we had been, uh, intelligence had indicated that there was a particular warehouse uh, in um, Chittagong which was housing uh, a lot of enemy war effort and it needed to be destroyed of course with the minimum or negligible damage to uh, civilian uh, property and life uh, we were thoroughly briefed for it uh, this was one particular morning and i don't remember was it the eighth or the ninth or the tenth morning that the uh, four seahawks were launched uh, i was number four 
with uh, ASCON commander uh, SK Gupta taking the lead. Uh, the ship was about a hundred, about about a hundred nautical miles away uh, from Chittagong, and our instructions were that on launch to remain in a formation and fly at deck level, at sea le sea top level, uh, in order to avoid the enemy radar. We were launched. It was a pre twilight launch that was we launched in the darkness so that by the time we get to the target it is just about twilight to carry out the attack early in the morning um, for the return we had been briefed not to return back on the same track this was very important this played a very important role subsequently for me we had to take a detour so we were briefed to fly out in an entirely different direction, 90 degrees to where actually the ship was. And then after flying for a certain length of time, we had to alter course and then head towards the ship. This is basically to avoid the enemy from knowing where Anas Vikrant was and not letting uh, or directing the enemy aircraft to Vikrant. We reached the target on time. The leader pulled up. It was a rocket projectile attack. We were, I think, carrying about 12 to 16 rockets each. We pulled up. The leader went into his dive. Three seconds later, number two. Three seconds later, number four went into the dive. And three seconds later, number five, number four went into the dive. That was myself. In the dive, I carried out all the checks, got the target in my sight did all the switches and I pressed the trigger, but for some reason, my rockets didn't go off. Now I was reaching the critical height by which I had to pull out. At reaching that critical height, I pulled out, realizing that all my 12 rockets were still on board, fully armed. That split of the moment, I also realized that I could not go back to the ship with armed rockets because it was dangerous for the ship. Also, at that point of time, I realized that I could not break radio silence because that was a stipulated order. Total radio silence. I was in a quandary. Time was failing. Number one, number two, and number three had already set course on the predetermined course. At that split second, I took a decision. I uh, turned back towards the target, positioned myself for a second attack, carried out this attack, did my switches all correctly and at the correct height, at the correct speed and at the correct angle, I fired my rockets, which fortunately went off this time. I pulled out and I then set course as was briefed earlier. I flew at the correct speed and at the correct height or the correct direction. At the predetermined time after the lapse of those minutes, I altered course and headed towards the ship. Fortunately for me, at that point of time, I heard our leader breaking radio silence and contacting the ship. And he was not aware that his fourth aircraft was not positioned at that point of time. But unfortunately, on the ship's radar, they could locate only three blips. The fourth blip was not seen. In the meantime, I managed to see the best ship. I sighted the ship. I then also sighted the formation of three aircraft. Fortunately, I positioned myself and I got myself into position with the four aircraft and we landed as one formation, one after the other. As you very rightly observe, there was quite a shamozil on board because the radar could only initially track three aircraft. Finally, they reported the straggler has been located and has joined the formation. <laughs> I regrettably was the straggler who came and joined this flight. Uh, that's, we finally that's, that's landed. Good. Nothing was spoken. Nothing was asked in the euphoria of the uh, success of the sortie. Nobody bothered to ask me what had happened. 
It is only late in the evening that I went to my squad commander and I related my story to him. <laughs> he was quite taken aback and he still remembers it. He still recollects it. But uh, we both decided to let us just sleep over it. So we did. But, but that makes for such a wonderful that makes for such a wonderful story years later 50 years later the straggler who took a split second decision i mean it's it's wonderful uh, so as sir a, as, a, as a matter of fact uh, i must mention here shrikant yes, that uh, um, late vice admiral johnny de silva our that's right. vice chief was at that time um, a gunnery officer on one of those escort ships yes and he recollects and he did write a postscript uh, on in the uh, this straggler who created a lot of uh, uh, uneasiness and worry on board his ship when they could not locate the fourth aircraft. There was a set of a sign of despondency which had set in the ship's crew. Okay, and they were all under the impression that uh, one of the aircrafts had been shot down. That's right. And then the joy of relief when it was sighted on the radar. Yes, sir. Admiral De Silva has written that for the Quarterdeck magazine. I, I, that was that is a very uh, wonderful contribution. So, sir, uh, as I start sort of uh, rounding up and taking probably the last last round of questions or a couple of questions, let me uh, sort of invert uh, the sequence a bit. Uh, I'll go to uh, Commander Kapil and then follow it up with uh, Commodore Essencing and Captain Seti uh, because I've got to still ask him about the blockade. But uh, Commander Kapil, sir, uh, you know, uh, just now Sandeep Unnithan reminded that you took the largest ever uh, Marcos operation uh, you undertook. But that was not all. I mean, like the split second decision that Commander Bada and his people took, you were so involved in the war. I mean, you could have rested on your oars after everything that you did before the war. But all of you, Captain Saman, you, Chiman, the rest of you actually got in that boat and went for that raid in the force alpha i mean that sort of hair raising and, and what's the sort of i mean it must take some peculiar brand of courage josh enthusiasm to get back into war and feel that you're missing a slice of action uh, and and go back to do it even though you had achieved enough by then can you can you sort of just give us a little sense of that spirit uh, that all of you had yeah i think that that was um typical of Captain Salmon, you know, always, always fidgety and always um, kind of uh, looking for action. So it was after um, all these um, war had broken out and uh, our, our things were being uh, wrapped up because there was no required of training and things. So um, when um, Captain Salmon went into uh, the ops room of uh, General Aurora, to talk to General Jacob because he had direct direct access, access to them and uh, that's how he took his command from uh, them and he was reporting to them. Uh, that's the time they were very busy. After a while, I believe, um, General Jacob asked him, he said, yeah, what bothers you? He said, no, sir, I'm like, I've got three ships. What do you want me to do? Because it was basically our operation, as you see, in a, in a uh, broader perspective, it was a support operation from Army, as well as um, the naval operations for uh, denying the enemy for um, their um, sea route, because uh, East Pakistan being a landlocked country, a landlocked country uh, there was no land route except in Myanmar, uh, Burma at that time, through Cox's Bazar, which was insignificant. And as you would recall that the air route was denied to them by after the hijacking of the Indian airline uh, aircraft in, uh, from Srinagar to Lahore in January of 71. So all the route uh, which was open to them was sea route. So um, that was the um, scenario. So General Jacob said, yeah, I think if you can go and uh, play up uh, uh, a little hell into Chala Mongla Kulla Bell, it'll be nice because uh, Pakistani army had uh, established a couple of strongholds all around the um, uh, Dhaka area uh, because they knew that yes, uh, it would be a tough, tough call when the Indian army comes in. So Jasur was one of the one of the areas where they were giving a tough time, and uh, that was the um, 
uh, cantonment in Khulna, which was spotting. And uh, uh, so that, that's the that's, uh, raid. It was a raid alpha, it was called. And it was just to uh, go and do disruptive acti activities and um, um, kind of uh, play up hell there so that um, their, their resources get diverted. So and um, that's how it started. And uh, we um, did achieve some because two of the boats were lost, as you know. Uh, yes, blue yes. and blue situation had developed and uh, somehow two boats got uh, knocked out. Uh, one was uh, Padma, in which uh, both were Bangladesh boats, where Bangladeshi crews and two officers were in the Navy. So, Mitter and Roy Chaudhary. <clears throat> I was in Roy Chaudhary's boat, which was Palash. And Chiman Singh was in um, uh, Padma, which was Mitter's boat. Mitter's boat was hit first and it was... Uh, caught fire immediately. Our boat was hit by the rockets in engine room uh, and a couple of strafing runs thereafter because we didn't uh, go down immediately. And uh, then only one boat was left. That was Pan Panwell. Panwell. So what, whatever <clears throat> Panwell could do, we did. Panwell picked us, the survivors. A couple of them, uh, like uh, Chiman Singh, uh, Natu Bandhapadhyay, and four officers, and uh, Mitter himself were taken prisoner of war by Pakistanis because they swam to the wrong shore, which was near, near um, uh, them after yes. they um, uh, bailed out on uh, abandoned the ship. Uh, me and Roy Chaudhary and uh, Raizad Awi <clears throat> were on the uh, eastward um, uh, border, like uh, bank. Eastward on bank. the Kutsav River. So yes. um, we had a different challenge to, to, to face because um, Razakars were all around and they were shooting it um, while, while we are trying to take cover and, you know, sort of um, make ourselves scarce in the, in the water. So uh, that's how it happened. So um, it, it did uh, pay up uh, whatever we were paid to do. Um, Pan Panwal um, uh, footed the bill and uh, we returned by 10th of uh, December. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. That's, that's bravery in air and bravery in ground. I'm coming back to Commodore SN, but I think my, my co-host uh, Mira has some question for someone. Uh, do, you, do you have anything? I'll, I'll come back in a bit. Uh, uh, go ahead, ask your question. Yes, uh, Commodore Kesnur. Uh, firstly, I want to thank the panelists for sharing uh, their thrilling and at the same time tragic experiences from the war. Uh, questions are pouring in. Uh, we have two questions uh, which are pertaining to Operation Trident and INS Betwa. One is from a, a Gadipati Siva Prasad, who's asking, who was the commanding officer of INS Kirpan during the Operation Trident? And what role was played by INS Kirpan and also INS Kachil? Uh, and the other question is uh, from Sanjeev V. Sardesai, uh, who's asking, was INS Betwa the same ship that participated in Operation Vijay at Marmagoa Port? Uh, in Goa's liberation. That, uh, took part in I, the, I think uh, I think the, uh, Captain Sethi can answer about Betwa, sir. Yeah, see, Betwa is the same ship which took part in the Goa liberation. And uh, uh, the thing regarding Kirpan is uh, Commander Aral Sud was there on that. Which uh, Commodore Hessen Singh will answer that. As per the Operation Trident is concerned, the you know the the ship that uh, sunk that day were first was Khyber, then Mohafiz, and this merchant ship that was sunk thereafter was had brought in all the all the ammunition for the Pakistani Air Force, Navy, and the Army from Saigon. So the Operation Trident took place on the second day of the war only. I mean, the war broke on the third and the fourth and fifth night, the Operation Trident took place. And what had really happened was that it was such a surprise because the aircraft had seen us moving well to the south. And uh, they thought that uh, we were going away from Karachi. And initially, we were, we were heading for Karachi. Then we turned south and went away from Karachi. But then, because Kachin and Kiltan and three missile boats for Operation Trident, they went headed straight for Karachi and played havoc in Karachi on the very second day of the war. Then we came back on the 8th and 9th, and then we had Operation Python, when we attacked Karachi second time. 
But I must say over here, there's a complete cooperation between the Navy and the Air Force. Because one of the missiles from Venash, and even also one missile earlier, during Operation uh, Trident, had gone and hit the oil farm. By the time the fire had been uh, put off during Operation Trident, during Operation Python, the second missile went straight into the oil farm and again lit up the fire in Karachi. Then later on, the Air Force would keep coming in and dropping bombs over there. You can imagine the kind of morale of the people in Karachi uh, city, in Karachi harbor, as well as the Pakistan Navy. But this was a cooperation between the Air Force and the Navy that really helped in a big way. And Karachi could be seen burning up to 70 miles away. I mean, that fire that took place uh, on the oil farm could be seen very, very far away. And uh, luckily, because we all went into different sites, we all took a different course and we joined later on. None of the Pakistan aircraft would detect us thereafter. So both the operation, Operation Trident, as well as Operation Python, which are both attack on Karachi. And later on, we split to go into Makan Coast. That is a different thing where we got a war booty. We picked up a merchant ship by name of Madhumati. She was a Pakistan ship. We captured her. And then, because we have finished all our missiles, then we returned back to Bombay thereafter. In the meantime, all the Pakistani ships had all entered, entered into Karachi port. There were no ships to fight with. I mean, we had no ships to fight with. And then we had a total blockade, as you saw on the chart. We had a total sea control of the Arabian Sea. And we had total sea denial to the Pakistan Navy. Now, there's a very, very important factor in war. Having sea control by the Navy, air control by the Air Force, and land control by the Army. Now, we had the whole sea control of the complete of Arabian Sea. The last day when we were going in for Makran coast, we had actually uh, sent our tanker, Deepak, which was with us, to go towards Oman. She went very close to Oman and came back. So you look at the chart, Oman is on the western end of the Arabian Sea, and Okha and Mumbai are on the eastern side of the Arabian Sea. Can you imagine we traversed right from Mumbai to Oman? And the whole of Arabian Sea was being controlled by us. We did not allow, I've not put the track of uh, Deepak over there because that would have made it more. What you see in the one is the Karachi of a group going and attacking Karachi, which is in the blue. And what you see is in the light orange is the Makran post when it picked up the Matumati. So you see the chart over here. We sailed from, from Mumbai, we are heading for Karachi, but because the aircraft came to us, that's why it is south. In the meantime, the other group, which is on the red line, that group went in and did the question to us. They did the attack right, right, uh, right. Operation Trident. Right. Sir, I think... Uh, yeah. In the meantime, it, we moved south and then we came in back for the second attack thereafter. Sir, the, the chart is very, very, so, very comprehensive. And I think you answered the question on... Yeah, but I must uh, say one thing, uh, Shikhan, there's something very... Yes, sir. Very, uh, you know, unique uh, uh, factor of 1971 war. Yes. The three or four point one and the two nations going to war, and third nation getting born. See, for example, even in the case of Second World War, the Germany was broken into West Germany is Germany. The Allies, you know, divided the journey you know, between between the communist bloc and the other bloc. Whereas we, the two nations going to war and a third nation getting born, that is number one. And the yes. second thing is the victory in 13 days. Because I'm telling you the Western, the Seventh Fleet had already set up from Hong Kong. And the 16th, the war got over. Luckily, they had to be in Singapore for three days. And they had to get all their logistics. Otherwise, they would have been here on the 11th or 12th in the, in the Bay of Bengal. The second thing is that the, the war getting over in from the 3rd to 16th in 13 days with 95,000 prisoners of war is a very, That's very right. unique aspect. Otherwise, Absolutely. if the civil fleet would have come in, the ball game would have been different. The third thing is the missile boats going and attacking Karachi, which they never ever thought. Pakistan could not even believe it. Even Russia would build the boats. Could not believe it as in Pakistan because we, we towed these boats. We towed them right up to the harbor, like in Vinash, she was just towed up to the harbor, fired the missiles, and again brought back by uh, Tishu. 
and the fourth is total blockade. We did not allow any uh, tanker from the Gulf to go to any Pakistan port. So you know these are very four very unique features of the 1971. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought this out in so much detail. Uh, the comment section are filling up. They're saying wonderful things. Uh, in fact, one comment I saw was of some sailor who worked on the Betwa. So that's wonderful. One of the viewers asked about Kirpan, you said. Uh, Kachal uh, viewers, Kachal was commanded by Commander K.N. Zadu. Uh, as some of you may be aware, he passed away recently. Uh, so, so we salute him for his efforts uh, uh, in this war. Uh, so, uh, uh, while Meera gets some other question, SN sir, I'd like to ask you a slightly different Hutke question. Um, after Kukri, you have grown in service. You have seen the Navy change uh, in all these years. And you've been some part of that change yourself. So, how do you assess today's Navy, having learned its lessons from Kukri, uh, how do you think it's poised today to face these challenges? <clears throat> the uh, service when I joined was steamships and uh, steam turbines gradually got into diesels gas turbines, western, eastern, and now hopefully going in for electric propulsion. Uh, we've had equipment coming in from 71, Russian weapon systems, British systems we inherited. And then now hopefully from a mix of Russian, American perhaps, hopefully the service gets into indigenous systems. As far as manpower is concerned, because I can see our ships are becoming thinly manned, lesser manpower, means our endurance actually increases because we can carry those many more Russians. So that's an amount of men. So the way I see it, the service and the number of platforms that are increasing is that the Navy will remain a very, very effective part of war fighting, uh, peacekeep peacekeeping operations, you name it. Around the same time, also our horizon, actually our horizon at sea is, in, is widening with things like uh, AIS coming in and uh, uh, ADS-B coming in. That means even the aircraft will start getting something like an uh, AIS with the result that our horizon literally we'll have a lot more information coming in uh, so we won't have to go around looking for uh, actually lookouts and things uh, we'll be getting so much more information we are also getting in the uh, uh, information fusion system uh, the center yes, yes. Uh, being set up at uh, already Gurugram. set up at uh, Gurugram so uh, not only that we are getting so much more of um, uh, unmanned aircraft coming in so you know uh, things are really increasing improving uh, budget of systems coming in so i i feel that uh, uh, life would be very interesting and I think um, we are, I, I really feel all four of us definitely are retiring at the wrong time in, uh, in uh, space. <laughs> I, I think that's a, a lovely way you put it. But, but I'm really taken up by your sentence when you say your, our horizon has expanded. 
you know, the maritime domain awareness has never been better. The sense of fusion has been happening excellently, but also in a strategic sense, our horizon has expanded. And that's something our uh, viewers should know. I saw an interesting comment uh, from uh, Sri Ratnaparki saying, was the uh, spirits dampened by the Seventh Fleet? Let me assure you, I think on behalf of the veterans, I can say, and you have seen that none of their spirits got dampened by any of these things. These were political and strategic moves which were dealt with at the adequate level. But at the field, as far as the Navy was concerned, there was absolutely no dampening of the spirits. Uh, Mira, you got one more question, I believe. Uh, yes, sir. My question is for uh, Commodore Bhada. Uh, sir, you have been uh, involved in uh, the Vikrant Memorial. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Is it over? No. Sir, so you got to unmute yourself, sir. So you got to unmute. It is because of her presence that we could establish a very effective contraband control in the Bay of Bengal. I had very sentimental reasons and was attached affectionately to the big ship, having flown many, many sorties by day and by night and operational sorties as well. The government, the state government, the central government try their utmost to preserve her as a museum. And the Navy did manage to make a museum out of her for a nearly a decade or so, but subsequently she had to be put under the hammer and sold as scrap. It was just a very casual, sentimental visit to the Darukhana scrapyard where she was being dismembered. A sad sight indeed, very, very sad sight. All her inards had been removed and spread all over the place. And there were truckloads of steel, metal, wires, aluminium, etc., being transshipped out. I happened to just pick up a small piece of steel of her flight deck. And I asked the gentleman if I could take it with me. He said, most certainly, sir. Please do that. When I got home, I said to myself, if I can pick up this little piece and keep it as a memento of big ship Vikrant in my house, why can't we buy more of this, acquire more of this scrap and make a memorial out of it? I just got this idea. I bandied this idea with some of my friends, some of my colleagues. I got hold of a very famous architect, a sculptor, Mr. Harzan Kambata, who was known to bring life to metal and took him with me to the site. He had a look at it and he said, yes, we can make a memorial out of this. I then set the ball rolling. Metal was going in truckloads, going out, sorry, going out from the scrapyard by truckloads and was disappearing very fast. I had to acquire this metal quickly if I wanted to put up this memorial. So I set the ball rolling. I acquired about two tons of this scrap material on the advice of Arzan Kambata. And simultaneously, I also started discussions with the BMC to give me a, a traffic island where I could put this up. And one thing led to another with many hiccups. And many doors opening, I managed to, we managed to put this magnificent little monument up, designed and sculpted by Arzan Kambata, financed by Mazikan Docks Limited, and with the help of the Western Naval Command, this memorial now stands just outside the Lion Gate in memory of this iconic vessel, INS Vikrant. 
please understand ladies and gentlemen that this war we fought was not an ordinary war many wars have been fought in the history of mankind but i believe this is the only war which has been fought which gave birth to a new independently elected democratic nation bangladesh borders have changed lands have been annexed albeit but this is the only war in the history of mankind i believe i might be wrong that has created a third of, of an independent democratic nation bangladesh and this is something we all indians must be proud of thank you uh, wonderful lady i think that this is great great Uh, no. wonderful sir wonderful that's a great way to sort of sum it up uh, ladies and gentlemen we would like to continue very much we'd like to continue asking but we been reminded by the organizers that time is running out it's friday evening everyone would like to sort of uh, uh, move on to the next event uh, so with with a very heavy heart i'll have to sort of start winding up uh, one of the uh, questions was Uh, what were the worst or uh, terrifying events that you encountered in the navy uh, while i'm sure many of us have encountered certain uh, memorable terrifying events there would have certainly been no worst events i think none of us would think that there were any worst events there are good events and better events and best events that the navy efforts us uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, on behalf of all of you i would like to extend a huge huge thanks Uh, to all our four war veterans uh, they are a illustrious legacy we wish and would want to emulate them if it ever came to that uh, they have set a sterling example and most importantly they were with you today to share their experiences uh, as they unfolded as they gave you experiences from different parts from different theaters uh, encapsulating several different experiences all i can say is it was fascinating listening to them for many of you ladies and gentlemen who have more questions and i'm sure you will have we have given you a email id please ask your questions and we will strive and endeavor to answer them for those of you who are keen to join the navy and i'm sure there will be many of you who want to do that again please contact us and we'll let you know how i'm sure uh, given all that you have heard witness today many of you would indeed be yearning to want for many of our listeners who were part of navy or whose families were in the navy or who grew up around the navy this may have been a memorable journey a little journey back into times past 50 years ago so we would like to tell you that please share your experiences this is a part of oral history and we would in this turn like to put it all together and see how we can spread the word around this is the year of the celebration of 50 years of that great war a war that created new geography as our eminent speakers have just reminded us i would like to once more thank them for their presence i would like to say sir it's been wonderful wonderful having you here and while we would like to continue uh, we would as they say all good things have to come to an end and with a very sort of heavy heart like to say thank you and bid you goodbye as i would like to call uh, the very wonderful host for the evening ira to propose a vote of thanks from all of us ira are you around I think that those heroic stories of war are hair raising, and they might look straight out of an action-packed movie, but I can assure you, are every bit real. They are the true embodiment of immense courage, resilience, and determination that I'm certain has inspired all of us. As we come to the end of this enthralling journey. 
I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to all our war heroes for sharing their scintillating experiences with us, the Indian Navy and the Western Naval Command for kindly providing us with this opportunity, the speakers for sharing all of their valuable knowledge, and finally, the organizing committee for putting in weeks of hard work to ensure that this event runs smoothly. Lastly, I would like to thank all of you, our dear viewers, for joining us today and extending your support and cooperation in making this event a success. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did presenting it to you. Stay safe and good night, everyone. Jai Hind. Kamro uh, Kesnur, thank you so much and good night and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for your presence. Bye. Good night, Bharat, sir. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye, sir. Well done. Bravo, Thank Zulu. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Bravo, Zulu. Now, how do we go off? Uh, you just have to leave the studio, sir. Okay. Just, just leave the studio. <laughs>